I'm in my 50s. In this video, I'm going to share with you six things that I wish I knew when I was in my 20s. Let's get cracking. First is your circle of relationships. And think of this as a stone dropped in water, where you're the point of impact, which is the most important part. And then following that, the first ripple is people who mean the most to you. In my case, it's my dad, my sister, and my family. Next, after that, are friends, people you have deep relationships with. So these might be people that you've known for years, people that you get on especially well with, people who when you spend time with them, when you leave, you feel better. And the next ripple is people who you're perhaps around through circumstance. So these might be work colleagues or people that you go to university with or school. And with those people, you might like them well enough, but they don't make you feel enriched and better for spending time with them like the other people do. So try and work out with your relationships which circle people are in so that you can dedicate more time to those who really make your life better for spending time with them. And this works in two ways. I've got a, a friend and he's part of a couple and we spend lots of time together and we have an amazing time, a really good laugh, we got on very well. However, over the years, I've spent lots of times uh, messaging him or trying to get him to meet up on a one by one to one basis and he never does. He always gives me a reason why he can't come, he's very polite, uh, but unlike my other friends, he never offers an alternative date or time. And that's because if he really wanted to come, <laughs> he would have made an effort to come. And it took me years to kind of realise that. And our relationship is just as good as it always is. We spend lots of time together still as, a couple, in, in, as couples. But I know that I'm in a different place on his circle to where he was on mine. And that means I can still have just as good a time with him when we do meet up, but I don't spend any time trying to get him to meet up on a one-to-one -one basis. Next is knowing the difference between an asset and a liability. Now, an asset is something that puts money into your pocket and a liability is something that takes money out of your pocket. For example, I love my Tesla Model Y performance it does 0 to 60 in 3.5 seconds and I'm a slow driver, but I love having all that power. It makes me very happy. However, the lease payment on that is very expensive. The insurance is very expensive and every month it goes down in value. And if I decided I wanted to change that car because I lease it, I don't own it, I would have to pay a penalty to get out of that lease. This car, as much as I love it, is very much a financial liability. And because I don't really want liabilities, I want assets, I use an asset to balance out that liability. Let me explain. So in 2004, I bought a very shabby, very ordinary studio flat. It was run down, it was cheap, and I refurbished it. And I put an extra window in because it was quite a large studio and I put a wall across the living area and made it from a large studio into a small flat. I kept it for two years, I rented it out and I sold it for a profit and I was left with a small profit, really it was £20,000 and with that £20,000 I had a choice. I saw a very nice BMW I wanted, the car of my dreams at that time, a BMW 530i. I could have put that money into a BMW 530i and what would that be worth 20 years later or 18 years later? it would have probably have lost about 90% of its value. Instead, I put that 20,000 pounds that I'd grown from the first asset into another asset, a larger property, which I rent out as a six bedroom house share. And that house share has paid for every single car lease that I've had since 2006. In addition to that, I went out and leased that BMW instead of buying that BMW as well. So I still got to drive the car of my dreams. Now that strategy isn't for everyone and where there's debt, there is certainly risk. So it's not something I would recommend that people rush out and do. However, understanding the difference between an asset and a liability is probably the biggest advice that I had in my, I wish I'd had in my twenties because I just didn't know. Next is the bliss point. And that is when food companies create foods that have the perfect amount of sugar, salt, and fat to create dopamine hits in your brain and make you crave those foods even more. So don't berate yourself if you aim to have one cookie but end up eating 10, even though the last three make you feel sick. 
we have done that. The food industry, or most of the food industry, is not your friend. After all, when was the last time you overate on foods like carrots and broccolis? It just doesn't happen, does it? When it comes to making good food choices, consider Pareto's rule, and that's the 80-20 rule. So make 80% of your food choices either healthy or at worst and neutral for you, and save 20% for more treat foods. And remember, people who make junk food will tell you to consume them sensibly, even though they've designed them to be addictive to eat. Gambling companies will tell you to gamble responsibly, even though Las Vegas looks like this. And alcohol companies will tell you to drink responsibly, even though after one or two drinks, your ability to make good decisions about your drinking is then diminished. Next is the financial team. And this is applicable for people if they want to get a job and get a job that's well paid. Now, quite often, so, and the easiest way to establish how well a job will be paid is by how many other people can do that job. So if you've got the top part of the T, which goes across here, this is wide and shallow. This means that lots of people can do the job that you're looking at doing, and therefore it may not get paid very well because competition will drive the price down of you as an employee. An example would be something like a McDonald's worker, for instance. Nearly everybody in society can work in McDonald's, therefore they've got a wide pool of people to choose from and the pay generally isn't that much above minimum wage. Moving down the vertical part of the T, there's a lot less competition as your skill sets grow, meaning there's less people that you're competing with to do a job. An example would be two people working on a construction site, for instance. The labourer, a job that most people can do, is going to earn less money than a bricklayer, a job that very few people are qualified to do. They're both in the same environment. They both have different jobs that pay a very different salary. So if you're looking to pick a career or increase your salary, double down on skill sets that set you apart from others. Because the less people who can do what you do, the more valuable your time and effort will become. Next is muscle and power. Now, according to the National Institute of Health, from the age of 30 and above, you will lose around three to 8% of your muscle mass every single decade. If you want to stay strong as you age and you're in your 20s, then it's not that difficult at this point to actually hang on to or increase the muscle mass that you already have. Find something you enjoy and stick with it. I've always had a very basic push, pull and legs routine and that's helped me maintain my muscle as I've got older. Power is also something that you start to lose as you get older. I trained for about 10 months to do 10 muscle ups and it culminated with me actually only managing nine. But this is nine more than most other people can do. These days I'm working on explosive power and I'm looking to maintain a 40 inch box jump all the way through my 50s and into my 60s. Find things you like doing with your body and double down on those and you absolutely won't regret it. If you're looking for a way to easily increase your activity and your cardiovascular strength, then watch this video here where I take you through my 10,000 steps a day challenge. Until next time, see you soon.